Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalia Moon-Larsen. I'm a senior research fellow at Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. My research mostly focuses on domestic developments in Russia, and it is my pleasure to introduce panel one to you. This first panel will present new research and different angles on state-society relations in Russia two and a half years after the onset of Russia's full-scale invasion on Ukraine. And uh, as Christian said, and I'm sure we all agree, that the consequences of this war have been enormous, and that research has also been affected. Many, including myself, myself are wondering how we can at all do research on Russia today. What can we actually find out? And this panel will give you some answers. The setup, the setup will be as follows. Each panelist will have 10 minutes individual presentation. And after that, we'll have a plenary uh, group discussion up here. And there will be an opportunity to ask questions from the audience. So it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, first speaker uh, today. It is Margarita Zavatskaya, who is a senior research fellow at Finnish Institute of International Affairs. And the title of her presentation is Decoding Russian Public Opinion, Balancing War Support and Peace Talk Sentiments. Margarita, the floor is yours. So good morning, everyone. First of all, it's a great honor to be the very first speaker at the NUPIS annual conference, so I'm extremely thrilled and nervous a little bit, so I will actually take a sneak peek at my nose from time to time to still stay within the, uh, oops. Okay, that's amazing. Okay, that's really good. Okay, so my presentation today will focus on the Russian public opinion regarding the war in Ukraine, what's going on there with political attitudes, and especially with a focus on the attitude towards hypothetical peace, uh, peace negotiations or peace talks. Of course, these questions are not on the table at the moment. I think it's quite obvious, but we're still probing our, the Russian public. So what's the reaction and actually how these moves swing depending on the ongoing uh, developments in the battlefields and political developments inside Russia and outside Russia. Um, I'll be sharing the findings from the panel study of Russian public opinion and attitudes, a project that is conducted by the University of Helsinki and the Alexander Institute. Uh, I'm also a proud affiliate of that uh, university uh, together with FIA. And before diving in into the, our findings, I'd like to clarify three important points. The first one, I do not claim that public opinion can predict political changes, so it's not a divination exercise by no means, right? Or we cannot predict the longevity of the Russian political regime or any serious political upheavals or protests or revolutions whatsoever. Second, public opinion in authoritarian settings should not be interpreted the same way as exit polls or electoral ratings from coming from originating from democratic context. So because for a very simple reason, political elites are not accountable to the people, as simple as that. And finally, although I'll be discussing respondents' attitudes towards hypothetical peace negotiations, again, this does not apply that peace talks are currently on the table. Okay, so without any further ado, let me uh, switch to the fresh from the oven data. Um, this is an overview of public support for the war in Russia. So our data from July 2024, that shows that support remains high. It's not as high as Levada, another reputable independent pollster reports, but still these data are comparable. They also kind of uh, can be triangulated with other ongoing research. Timothy Fry is going to develop and talk about that in a while. I really hope and looking forward to that. So though many respondents either refused or, uh, to answer or express uncertainty, I think this figures are still quite striking. So our fresh findings from the uh, telephone representative survey that we conducted last week, uh, the, uh, this is online survey from July, and the more fresh data from October actually reports 54 support, like unambiguous support for the ongoing war. All the rest are split between don't knows, refuse to answer, we intentionally introduce the category to allow people to sort of avoid uncomfortable question and to see how it kind of uh, changes over time. So, and also we also look into what category, what groups of populations actually switch from one category to another because our data are of panel nature. So we can keep track 
within individual, within respondents, uh, fluctuations and changes. So I think it's probably one of the biggest value of this project. Um, so 54%, it's still a lot, but it's not 80. To capture more candid opinions on sensitive issues, we employ the so-called LIST experiment following the footsteps of, again, Timothy Fry and his colleagues. This is a method that compares responses between, to direct and indirect questions to account for potential sensitivities and preference falsifications. So this helps us identify hidden attitudes, if there are any, and basically to check whether people lie or they do not lie. What we found out, so there are no large scale preference falsifications sort of corroborating previous findings. So Russian respondents do not lie, but it still doesn't say that they kind of do not seek the ways to sort of avoid uncomfortable questions. So look at the categories, do not know and refuse to answer. So uh, another interesting finding is the gender gap when it comes to support for the war. With men showing higher levels of support than women, this may reflect, obviously, men's closer association with military service and national defense, while women might be more concerned with the economic and humanitarian costs of the war, right? Because females are probably, represent the more vulnerable group of the Russian population, so under the hit harder by the economic grievances, the loss of breadwinners, et cetera, et cetera. As an example, one can recall the women's protests, Ekaterina Andreeva, for example, one year ago, which took place on the eve of the uh, presidential elections in Russia. So here we see a significant number of respondents either refusing to answer the question, so 50%. This is a dynamic uh, indicator from the previous wave before the presidential elections, and uh, the second wave is from July, so we see that the numbers are, are quite stable. And also what is quite striking, um, the amount of a number of respondents who said that they do not know or they don't know the right answer, it's 22%. It's not ignorance, it's not being apolitical, it's intentional and unambiguous refusal to respond, to react to this question. I think it's important for us to understand how these amplified support for the war is constructed. Right, so I think it speaks into one of the potential mechanisms, how it works. So despite strong support for the war, we still found that and this is the next slide, around half of our respondents also expressed support for hypothetical peace talks. This result is consistent with recent waves by recent surveys by Levada Center, the Chronicles Project or Extreme Scan Project, independent posters still operating in Russia. Um, they also report about around 55-60% of Russians indicating that they would favor one way or another some sort of negotiations. Although an important caveat here is that some of the polls do not specify the conditions under which these negotiations actually could, can take place. Some of them, for example, chronicles say like, would you support the immediate removal of the Russian troops from the Ukraine from the occupied territories? Although it's not specified which, specified which territories are occupied, right? Crimea is a very specifically sensitive question, or Donbass, et cetera, et cetera. Probably by default, Russian respondents would think of Kherson and like newly occupied or acquired from the Russian perspective territories. So this is an important caveat to bear in mind. Well, on one hand, it shows that the belligerent patriotic narratives or wartime propaganda continues to hold sway. On the other hand, the presence of war fatigue and economic pressures, I don't show any figures on that, but I'm ready and willing to comment on that too, suggest that a significant part of the population is open to exploring alternatives, so to speak. However, we need to look deeper, need to look deeper into the mechanisms that shape public opinion authoritarian regimes. And for example, using endorsement experiments or elite cues experiments is another useful, potentially productive avenue to, for exploring this. And I hope I still have time and let me share one of the fresh data from uh, our recent uh, research together with Kirill Shamif and Riza Brooks. Um, it uh, speaks to the also how public opinion may operate under non-free constraint, politically constrained uh, conditions. So in authoritarian settings, public opinion is more susceptible to elite narratives, right? These elite cues reflect the safe interpretation of political process or whatever is going on around the respondents. So acting as a proxy for what citizens believe is acceptable or is safe to pursue or say out loud. So here you can see the example, the template we use as for as one of our textual uh, vignettes. Uh, we run several experiments, but it's just one of them. So our method is basically, our method isolates the effect of military and diplomatic endorsements. So there are military elites and there are civilian elites. 
uh, both positive and negative, some of them endorsing the potential peace negotiations and other ones actually uh, opposing that proposition. So we randomly divided the samples, three and a half thousand respondents into five groups. One control group received no endorsement. Two groups received positive endorsements, either from military elites or diplomats supporting hypothetical peace talks, and two groups received negative endorsements, either from military elites or diplomats opposing hypothetical peace talks. So, and finally, this is the last slide. So uh, I decided not to bombard you with plenty of data, although we're sitting on a pile, on a huge pile of empirical data, and uh, it's really hard. That's why I'm reading, otherwise I will deviate and will tell you all sorts of anecdotes we have. So this plot shows the results of the endorsement experiments while military and diplomatic elites opposed hypothetical peace talks. Support for negotiations dropped significantly. So as soon as respondents face conflictual Venus or treatments, so they become more belligerent in a sense, right? So in contrast, positive endorsements for peace, for example, had very little effect. So this can be explained by the so-called negativity bias, very well known in political, from political psychology. So all, I mean, negative information draws much more attention. So we react we emotionally, it, we react strongly, uh, stronger to such, uh, I would say, treatments and interventions. On the other hand, the mechanism can be a little bit different because when it comes to the peace negotiations in the Russian context, all Russian propaganda was about we are winning and we're about to win the war and we're about to have like so many gains and Russia is going to prosper. But when it comes to while of a sudden about negotiations, it can be perceived as a potential defeat, that something bad is happening and that things are out of control. And we also kind of sort of tra uh, tap into existential security. Again, for those responses who do consume regularly Russian television and do believe or tend to trust more uh, to whatever uh, information is coming from the Russian media outlets. So finally, to conclude, so what does this tell us to, about whether Russia is strong or weak? Uh, from the public opinion's vantage point, so first, it's clear that there, there, is no, there is no 80% of people who actively support the war. There are no people marching in the streets, so to speak. So uh, many people are simply going with the flow. Influenced by negative elite cues, all sorts of propaganda, but again, propaganda preaches to the converted. It has a very limited potential to convert those who actually already have some doubt in their heart, right? Um, Second, this also means that in the event of exogenous shocks or some surprises, the, event, uh, the regime or especially the ongoing war are not going to get an overwhelming support. So people would surrender, they would actually take whatever. They would, again, they would go with the flow. Public opinion in this case is more reactive and reflects inertia. It's by no means a harbinger of drastic political changes. So we should really stop doing this divination exercise and looking at the Levada polls or looking at any other polls because again, they capture yesterday's picture. They do not predict the future and they never predict the future. So I think I should stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Margareta, uh, for your insights. Uh, our second uh, speaker today is Vitana Yerpelova, who is a researcher at the University of uh, Bremen and also works for Public Sociology Laboratory. And she will talk about typical ways of war uh, justification in Russia. Welcome, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Really honored uh, to be here today. And uh, in my 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, people's attitudes uh, to the war as well. And specifically, I'm going to focus on uh, how war perception is related and can even be partly explained by people's perception of the state and authorities in power. Uh, and I'm going to do it based on the large-scale qualitative research by a public sociology laboratory. Uh, so we conducted three waves of data collection in uh, spring 2022, fall and winter 2022, and finally in fall 2023. Uh, and we collected a lot of uh, so-called in-depth interviews, and during the third stage of data collection, uh, we we did ethnographic field work in three Russian regions. You can see it on the slide. Uh, you can learn more about the research uh, using this QR code later, maybe. Uh, 
and uh, important remark, uh, here today I will only be talking about people who generally support the war, especially when they are asked directly about it, but who are at the same time not core war opponents. So they do not really have consistent position on the war. Uh, and our data shows that these people can talk about the war in three different modes or regimes. Sometimes they can even switch between them during the same conversation. Uh, and each of these uh, modes or regimes presupposes a particular relationship between the people and the state. Uh, so uh, the first one, uh, mode of uh, in the mode of uh, engaged uh, justification, people uh, identify with the state against outside world, and they emotionally justify why we, meaning Russia, uh, is morally right fighting in Ukraine. Uh, to the contrary, on the mode of criticism, people uh, counterposition themselves to the state and see the state action being directed to them, to regular people, and see uh, kind of war, criticize the war as harming them, regular Russian, Russians, uh, as you can see on this quotation, they are sending our boys uh, to the war. And finally, in the mode of uh, distanced uh, justifications, people disidentify from the state uh, without counterpositioning themselves uh, to it and basically assume that state knows better how to do their business and they, regular Russians, should mind their own business. And in the, last, uh, in the rest of my presentation, I will focus on this last mode or regime distance uh, justifications. Uh, so to begin with, uh, there are two main uh, dispositions towards uh, state or authorities uh, lots of people like that uh, share. Uh, the first one is uh, this feeling of powerlessness, inability uh, to affect state's decisions, which leads to people's withdrawal from participation. This example here, it's an informal conversation which happened at a so-called girl party in the city of Tiromoshkin, Sverdlovska Oblast. Uh, at some point, participants of the party started discussing uh, upcoming, at this point, presidential election in Russia, and it appeared that no one is going to vote. Uh, and let's see how one of them, Alona, justifies it. Uh, she says, I don't see the point. Everything is already decided in advance. Whether you vote or not, it's seems to me it doesn't matter. So although she does sound quite critical, her solution is not to oppose it or to protest, her solution is to avoid participation. Another disposition is this uh, fear of change to the wars, which leads at the end uh, to loyalty to the status quo. Example here is one of the conversation our researcher had uh, with a taxi driver, and the taxi driver here says, uh, Valodya, meaning Putin, uh, is just holding on to his position, not doing anything. Again, it looks quite critical towards Putin, right? But then he continues, uh, but if you remove Valodya and put someone else uh, in his place, it's unclear what would happen. So let's keep it as it is. Uh, basically, we see that these people are not happy with the various aspects of state politics, but they learned to justify it anyways. How do they do it? For example, uh, they can identify problems very well in detail, but just avoid attributing responsibility for them to anyone. Basically present this as it's just happening or they can normalize the situation, suggesting that, well, it was or it is always like that. Example here, it's an um, excerpt from an um, interview with a woman who works in the election commission, uh, and she notices uh, and discusses here in interview uh, the fact that this option of uh, voting against everyone uh, disappeared from electoral ballots uh, some time ago, and basically it was one of the legal ways for people to express their discontent, right? And she is not happy with that, but let's look how she talks about it. She says, uh, this is the reality. They 
set boundaries for us. They always put us within certain limits, no matter what. You come to work and they say, we have a dress code, for example. You're not going to intentionally break it just because you don't like it, right? You have to learn how to navigate it. Or they can uh, rationalize the situation, assuming that authorities do know better what they're doing. Another quotation here, uh, let me start uh, from the middle of this quotation. So this guy's student, uh, he says, that's higher up. Those are all Putin's decisions. They don't ask us. Uh, we don't want some reforms. We are against them, but they say it has to be done. And that's it. They do it. So again, looks quite critical, but let's now look at the first, uh, first sentence, and he says, I don't think it's for us to decide whether the war should have been started. That's higher up. That's are all Putin's decisions. So now we see that actually he says it in order to justify not intervention, to justify that the authorities know better what to do. Uh, and now back, back to the war. Uh, so in uh, February uh, 2022, many Russians were caught by surprise uh, by uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and they had to invent some ways to reconcile with it. Uh, and uh, we could see now that um, at least part of the war justifications can, uh, were not uh, invented or created from the scratch and were not even directly borrowed from propaganda. People just started to justify war uh, similar to how they used to justify other unpleasant decisions of their state. Uh, for example, they may support continuation of the war, not because they actually approve what's going on or like it, but because they fear that losing the war can be even a greater catastrophe. Or uh, they um, uh, can describe di different terrible events happening during the war, but they uh, avoid attributing responsibility for it to anyone. So basically, war is presented here as a natural catastrophe or occurrence, which is terrible, but with which we just cannot do anything like on this picture here. Uh, or they can normalize the situation, suggesting that um, wars happen all over the world, they're a normal part of global processes, or so terrible, of course, and we just need to learn to live in a world like that. Or uh, they can, of course, rationalize it, assuming that um, state or authorities know better what they're doing, and there must be a reason for this war, even uh, if they, ordinary people, don't know this reason. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Um, so it is my pleasure to invite our third speaker uh, on the stage, it's Jeremy Morris. He is a professor at Aarhus University and the title of his presentation is Fictive Kinship and the, at the Nexus of Paternalist and Neoliberal Corporatism? Question mark. Question mark. <laughs> yeah, always put a question mark in your talk. Um, okay, thank you everybody. Um, and. Rita and Svita have already done a lot of my work for me, uh, following on from Sveta's talk uh, right at the outset, I can say that most of the people that I engage with in my ethnographic work on Russia have very conflicted and inconsistent opinions about the war, even in the same conversation, as Sveta said. And so the, we were asked by Newpi to think about sources of social cohesion, right? And so I thought, because I knew that my illustrious colleagues with much better data on public opinion would be already talking about these topics, that I would talk about something a little bit different, which is to think, okay, so we know now that Russians, we know that Russians know that they have no sources of political representation, so why would they seek social cohesion through political engagement. There can be no meaningful civil society either. Second source of social cohesion, a, some kind of welfare state compact, right? You know that the state will look after you, uh, and that 
provide some source of incorporation into the body politic. That's also not possible in Russia. We know that, right? The third form, then, would be a tried and tested uh, state of affairs that actually goes back to the Soviet period, if not before. And that would be looking to employment relationships enterprise incorporation as a form of cohesion. And so that's where the term paternalism comes in. So there's a, there's a big literature on Soviet enterprise paternalism. The Soviet state delegated huge social and economic functions to the firm or enterprise. At the same time, of course, we do not live in the Soviet Union anymore. We live in what some people, including me, argue is one of the harshest neoliberal state capitalist regimes in the world. And we can also see that from the adverts for people joining the war. And you can see this has been translated, but this is a real uh, advert in the Moscow metro offering people five million rubles to join up uh, and fight in the war. So, today I'll talk a tiny little bit about one small element of my new book, which is coming out uh, in the new year, Everyday Politics in Russia, From Resentment to Resistance. And I'll be talking, and I'm talk, I talk in one of those chapters about this uh, question of what paternalism means today. Because, let's face it, for most of the people, and we already heard for, about that from our previous speakers, for most of the people, they want to keep the war away from themselves. They want to hunker down, bunker down, avoid the war. Mobilization or volunteering for the war is not a viable economic or social strategy for 90% of the population, maybe 95% of the population, right? If we look at the number of people volunteering, it's very, very small. In fact, this is the source of most of Russia's problems. They cannot persuade people that fighting, volunteering, joining the army is a viable form of social incorporation um, in Russia. So some of the things I talk about in this part of my book is different forms of response to this challenge. Um, and we can Fight, we can kind of use the word entrepreneurialism as well to think about the agency of ordinary people as they negotiate these challenges, including the challenge of where to look to get a refuge from the war, right? And so my work is based on nearly 20 years of ethnographic inter interaction with a very diverse uh, group of informants uh, in Kaluga region, in Moscow, and I'm able to go back to these people and talk to them and follow their work biography and so I have a strong sense of internal validity to my very small sample. So I'm doing something that I think triangulates really well, but which is very different from the work that Svetlana and uh, Margarita are doing. And so I look at these working biographies before and after, since the war, and what uh, uh, my colleague Galina Arlova of High School of Economics Moscow has called the eternal little tricks that Russians have to employ to get by. And since the war, these have included looking for work-based protection from the war in exchange for enterprise loyalty to your enterprise. So there are dozens of job titles which allow you to be exempt from military mobilization. And that's been relatively well researched. Perhaps, uh, perhaps less well researched is both mobility and immobility as a defense mechanism. So you can run away and hide, you can leave the country, that's mobility. Um, but you can also remain stuck in place, but make yourself less visible to the state, right? And there are many ways of doing that because of the inadequacy and the poor state capacity that Russia has. Um, and then a final one would be, again, a, a historical phenomenon of seasonal labor mobility within Russia. So things that we find, things that I find from this, uh, yes, definitely, people that I in, in talk to, uh, they articulate increased self-exploitation as part of a, an informal bargain with their employer. Uh, what do they get in return for that? They get inflationary linked uh, pay, which is a big problem, right? Non-indexation uh, for some people. 
they also get, in, in some cases, formal or informal protection from the draft, from mobilization. But also, given Russia's demographic and labor problems because of the war, actually we should look at workers, and not just blue collar workers, but all kinds of workers, as having much higher bargaining power today because of the shortage of labor. And so in my book, I talk a little bit about how firms perform a kind of paternalistic care towards workers. They uh, offer all kinds of social functions, uh, which again recalls certain Soviet practices of paternalism. Um, and yeah, I look at a number of case studies. I'm not going to go into the first three case studies, uh, but just right now in the very short time that I have, I'll focus on Nikita and Anton. These are obviously pseudonyms. Nikita I have known since 2009, um, and he always was willing before the war to be really, really mobile. He would go to Moscow and work for six months. He would go uh, into the informal economy and work as a taxi driver for six months. He would completely drop out and uh, become like a hippie for six months. But especially since the war and even before the war, he really surprised me. Maybe it is also to do with age as one gets older. He really expresses a very strong loyalty now to his firm, a firm in Kaluga, which is doing really, really well making metal fastenings for the building trade. Because of course, after all the Western companies left, there is now actually a boom in uh, what we call green field sites, uh, big box production sites, turnkey factories, okay? And so construction industry and industry related to construction is doing really, really well. His company is re doing really, really well. He expresses, he expresses uh, all kinds of uh, uh, loyalty and thankfulness um, and negotiation with his firm. And I discuss this case study in detail in my book. Uh, and then we move to Anton, um, who's from a similar cohort of working class men in Kaluga region. He used to work for Volkswagen. Of course, he can't do that anymore because Volkswagen doesn't exist in Russia. But he also expresses um, similar experience of uh, loyalty to his firm. But his is a very new firm, also doing really, really well because of the war, but only indirectly making ventilation systems for large buildings. And there's even a YouTube video uh, where his employer talks about all the wonderful opportunities that the war has brought for the working class because they can be incorporated through enterprise loyalty. Um, and again, perhaps beyond Anton, his firm is a really interesting example because this guy, his boss, might become a new oligarch in time. He has gone from running a small business with around 50 people to potentially next year having four or five factories and maybe a thousand employees. So to, and I call that, I call Anton's case a kind of supplicant mobility. So he's been forced to move because of the war and he's grateful for that. So um, why do we care? Why should we care about this question of incorporation and new corporatism, paternalism, or what an anthropologist might call, like me, fictive kinship? Like, you feel, you feel a sense, sense of family with your uh, boss. We should care about it because it shows that there are strong, tectonic, below-the-surface movements of sociality, and that doesn't really, it doesn't really matter what Russia's political regime is. These things exist, right? As I said, there are historical patterns that come again and again of defense by ordinary people against state power. This strong historical frame of devolution of corporatism, which is very unlike China, so there's a big contrast between what Russia does and what China does. Um, Paternalism, it seems to me, comes to the fore, and the search for paternalism as well, when there is a crisis. And again, the state is seen as lacking. We saw that very strongly in Svetlana's presentation. The state, for many people, is something that doesn't have people's interests in mind. And then, um, if you'll just permit me, 
to reference Caroline Humphrey's work, one of the greatest anthropologists of Soviet and post-Soviet Russia. She made this point that Russia has always been characterized by the importance of possessive domains outside the state, right? And that whether it's an enterprise, an organization, a university, an informal network, these possessive domains are super important for understanding what lies beyond uh, the encompassing state form in Russia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, and uh, last but not least, I invite Yulia Willemsen, who is a research professor at the Norwegian Institute, Institute of International Affairs. And Julie's focus is Chechnya, and she will talk about how the Kremlin govern, governs this region through Ramzan Kadyrov. The floor is yours, Julie. Thank you very much. I am not going to use a power presentation, uh, but I think that the reality behind the words of my presentation are going to be graphic enough. So I will speak on how the Putin state governs Chechen society, zooming in on the period after the COVID pandemic and the onset of the full-scale war on Ukraine. But first, I would like to stress that the Kremlin's governance over Chechnya and the Chechens has been an outlier compared to other parts of Russian society. Chechnya is the only tiny republic, as you see, if you can identify it, down here, which has been subjected to all-out war twice since the Soviet Union uh, fell apart, the only republic to have a separatist conflict. And Moscow actually never won control by military means over Chechnya during the Second War, which started in 1999, uh, but through the installation of a middleman, of a Chechen middleman, namely Ahmad Kadyrov and then his son Ramsan Kadyrov. And Kadyrov has a uh, rule has implied brutal, violent repression inside an already war-torn, punished society. And often by instrumentalizing or even perverting Chechen religion, which is Sufism, and Chechen cultural practices. Simultaneously, Kadyrov has developed a mutually dependent relation with Putin. In return for massive funding and arms, Kadyrov has offered his uh, martial services through the Kadyrov Sea, who have sometimes killed off Kremlin critics, such as probably the killing of Nemtsov in 2015, and also offered Kadyrov Sea to, uh, as soldiers in Putin's war in the Donbas in 2014 and in Syria 2015, for example. So, uh, and further, Kadyrov has been given and taken the liberty to carry out policing, racketeering, killing outside the Chechen Republic, in the North Caucasus region and in the Russian uh, Federation with total impunity. So, why am I saying all of this? This has been going on for many years. It is to underline the distinctiveness of state society relations between Moscow and Chechen society and between Moscow and Grozny compared to other uh, subjects in the Russian Federation. And this was very clear for many years before the invasion of Ukraine. So inside the tiny Chechen Republic, there has been in this period a progressive accumulation of coercive capacity over Chechen society in line and pushed through the rationale of full control of first the terrorists, then combatants, potential combatants and the families of the potential combatants. This has included forced confessions, illegal arrests, extrajudicial killings, abductions, blackmail, arsons, collective punishments in different forms. So the social habitat inside of Chechnya, I have not been there, but this is my conclusion from what I read, is one of pervasive distrust, fear, squealing and impunity before the onset of the pandemic. So the paper I'm working on, I ask the question, what have what we might call the unsettled times of COVID and war in Ukraine 
What has this changed in Moscow's rule of Chechnya via Kadyrov? In particular, in particular, have these times increased the possibility for Chechen society to articulate, critique or resist this type of rule? First to the COVID pandemic. It was unsettling for Kadyrov rule because it changed the political agenda and the tasks that Kadyrov had to fulfill from Moscow. And the out of outbreak of the pandemic uh, elicited contradictory messages from the center and animate different parts of Chechen uh, society on a different issue area. So there was discontent with the COVID-19 regime and this was articulated from the bottom. Rules and instructions were challenged from below, but the, sh the regime quite quickly took back control to refer Kadyrov and to make you understand how this works. He said, violation of the quarantine rules will be punished with death. So there are two <coughs> traits uh, I observe. I don't know how correct they are. I work with um, media sources from, from the region, but I have observed two traits during the pandemic. The first is that surveillance over the Chechen, Chechen society is increased via the internet and by physically checking people's phones. For so for example, 25 people, including children, were um, uh, detained for possibly posting or sending an image of Ramsan Kadyrov in Orthodox Christian garb dressing. And throughout this period, coercion persisted in a recognizable form, so illegal arrests, killings and abductions. And I would say it reached even further into the private lives of Chechens, not least because of a new and by now widespread practice of what we call coercion to public apologies. These have become widespread at, and focused on the private morale, family codes of conduct and even theological standpoints. Now these public confessions, they might seem insignificant or even funny if you view them on a telegram canal, but actually they speak of a society thoroughly penetrated and governed by brute force and bodily violence. So another widespread practice in this period is the targeting of combatants armed with a pen. And this is logical because there are no armed combatants to fight in Chechnya any longer because of the repression. But there is this fight against combatants armed with a pen. So in the years before the invasion of Ukraine, we saw a string of killings or attempted killings, and we even noticed them because they actually happened in, in Europe, many of them. In France, Sweden, Germany, uh, and Austria, and in Russia, of course. So moving on uh, to the onset of the large-scale war against Ukraine. <clears throat> this did not represent a new type of governmental challenge. The Kadyrov regime was engineered precisely to supply indigenous Chechen martial services to further the goals of the Putin regime. Remember, from the very beginning. So in February 2022, Kadyrov immediately staged a show of several thousand Chechen security forces in Grozny, claiming that over 70,000 volunteers are ready to go to fight the war in Ukraine. The regime's coercive rep uh, repertoire has been replicated and expanded. Families were forced to send their sons as volunteers. An industry of paying ransom to save your lo loved ones has, has reappeared in Chechnya. According to uh, human rights organizations who still try to work in the region, there are particularly three groups uh, which are targeted. It is the critics and their relatives, those who try to flee mobilization and their relatives, and prisoners. And then I would like to mention also, quite ironically, that uh, what is called Russia's University of Special Forces has been established in Gudarmes, Chechnya, where 
uh, the, it's a kind of a factory for making soldiers and sending them off to Ukraine. And now there are not any not an longer just Chechens who are trained here into the so-called Spetsnaz Ahmad forces, but people from all over the Russian Federation. Um, yeah, and of different ethnic origin. So my time is running out here, um, but I would like to say a few words about the what kind of ideology or worldview that the Kremlin Kadyrov leadership propagates and to what extent it reflects the ideas of Chechen society. Just a couple of points. First, contradicting the core Chechen trauma and collective myth of violent subordination to the Russian state, which Chechens have uh, in their memory from colonization of the North Caucasus, from the deportations of the Chechens together with other nationalities in 44, and two all-out wars since the end of the Soviet Union. Um, Kadyrov says that this subordination was voluntary and authentic. Putin is represented as Chechen's supreme, uh, supreme commander, even their national leader. Chechens are partly to blame for their own deportation, according to Kadyrov, and the memory of the two recent wars are eradicated from the physical space in Chechnya. And then the Kadyrovs exploit the Chechen religion and uh, custom to legitimize their rule and mobilize the Chechens to war. So the war in Ukraine for, uh, for Chechens is a jihad. It's for the Quran, it's for Allah. Simultaneously, uh, Kadyrov's worldview closely aligns with that of the Kremlin in a, ve in a very recognizable form. So Chechens went to war to, pr uh, to protect the Ukrainian people, Russia, and their belo beloved homeland from the neo-Nazi regime in Ukraine, the Satanist West, NATO, and Europe. So this is an eclectic and absurd mix, but it shows you how the, the line of control goes and the Ahmad Spetsnaz, their um, uh, chant is Ahmad is strength. Ahmad is the father of Ramzan then. Ahmad is strength, Russia is power, Allah Akbar. So an absurd but very telling uh, chant. And then I have no time left, but I want to say that what I'm trying to do in this paper is to find out how can we study resistance, because I am sure there is resistance in Chechen uh, society. And one small sign, which I would like to, to mention, is, for example, that the day of mourning on the 23rd of February has been taken away from the Chechens. So they cannot commemorate, for example, the deportations in the way that they did, but they do a very simple thing in some villages. They have decided to just open the gates to their houses on that day to mark their resistance. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Julie. And now I will ask uh, the panel to join me on stage. So, uh, according to, to my watch, we have approximately 27 minutes left. Uh, yes, so um, uh, I will start with some questions from me before we open up the floor uh, for a couple of questions from the, from the audience. And, uh, and as we remember, I'm sure that the, the title is, uh, for the conference is uh, Wartime Russia, Weak or Strong. Um, and listening to all of you, I, I've been thinking uh, throughout the first presentation is how interesting it is that uh, practices uh, and issues that seemingly uh, make Russia strong uh, also uh, make it weak, uh, right? So uh, uh, maybe something to think about and address uh, in your uh, answers to me. But first, first I would like to to ask you about research and, and methods uh, in wartime uh, Russia. 
And uh, first question goes to you, uh, Margarita, uh, because you do uh, you in introduced uh, and showed us some survey uh, results. And I was wondering, how can you even continue carrying out uh, surveys now, and, and how can you trust the information that we get from surveys? Okay, so, right yeah, so uh, thank you so much for, for this question, for the opportunity to elaborate on that. I intentionally dropped that part, part because uh, I was really hoping uh, to address it during the Q&A. Uh, first of all, well, the short answer is yes, we can still carry out surveys in the settings such as Russia. Russia, Russia is not the only personal dictatorship in the world, honestly speaking, right from a broader comparative perspective. Mm -hmm. So there are some uh, many other countries like China or Malaysia before the uh, interesting processes back in 2016, etc. So Russia in this sense is not that special. So yes, we can carry out surveys. The problem is how do we deal and how do we treat the data we obtain? So and as I mentioned in my talk, so it's not it's not exit polls, right? Because the very connection between the public audiences and the decision maker is broken, or it works in a very different way, like perverse accountability, we can call it different ways. So this is why it's really important to kind of always keep it in mind when we see these numbers. If we see 8%, it, it's not a legal proof of collective guilt or responsibility. Of, it's not a legal document either, right? So it's just a number that we need to know. We need to have a special expertise to understand how authoritarian regimes operate and basically to make sense of this data. So what I see problematic is not obtaining, getting the data, but the kind of question we ask, that's the first thing. And second, what we do with this data and how we deal with them, what kind of media debate or policy debate revolves around it. It requires special skill and special understanding of non-democratic politics. So it's important caveat, important thing to keep in mind when we again see another pile of Levada data coming out and being published and distributed through the media. So yeah, that would be my probably short answer. To this question. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Svetlana, in the same line, I guess you, you talked about uh, focus groups and, and field work in Russia, uh, and uh, you have been talking to people about the war, but how can you talk uh, to people about the war, uh, war today? Uh, uh, will people avoid answering? Uh, what were your um, techniques? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you for this question and I'd like, uh, I guess, uh, to start with supporting what just Rita said. Uh, it's indeed possible to study Russia in various of methods, with surveys and also talking to people, talking to people in a more formal way, in a more informal way, in person, by social media, so it's all possible and I think it's important to keep in mind that we do continue studying Russia and we actually have quite rich data. And indeed what uh, we've done, we've done uh, in-depth interviews Reviews and also ethnographic field work and uh in both cases, we uh, did talk about the war directly and also indirectly. Uh, we tried some uh, techniques to talk about the war indirectly, uh, not because people, as Rita said, lie, they don't really, uh, but because they just talk differently in a more informal context about the war. And that's what we wanted to analyze, for example, how they switch between different modes of uh, uh, talking about the war and things like that. Uh, and uh, we use different techniques, both in interviews and in ethnographic field work. For example, in interviews, we try to ask uh, several questions about the war, but not asking directly about the attitudes. So, for example, we would uh, ask people to describe uh, 24th of February, just describe the day. It actually works very well, right? So just describe what happened to you. You woke up and then what happened? Uh, and describe your emotions. And we have quite rich narratives about the war, not asking directly what, what do you think. Then we would ask, and what have changed since then? It also worked very well. Then we had a couple of questions like, uh, what do you think would have happened if Russia would not uh, have attacked Ukraine in February, right? So it's also not asking what are you against or for, but 
basically it is asking about it in a more indirect way. Then in ethnographic field work, uh, it was important, so we kind of, uh, in interviews, we saw that people sometimes struggle in answering even these types of questions. And we wanted to approach it from more informal perspective to see how people talk about the war in real, in real life. So not the, when they answer questions to researchers, right, but when they just hang out with each other. Uh, and problem is that people don't really talk about the war that much, so you cannot just walk on the streets and like listen people talking. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work unless you're really lucky. Uh, so we did some type of kind of research interventions. So people would hang out, uh, researchers would hang out with people uh, and introduce the topic of the war, but in a way which uh, in which uh, our informants, people can relate to it. For example, when we did uh, field work in Krasnodarsk uh, Krai, uh, kind of close to the war zone, uh, researchers would ask like a taxi driver or something like, oh, uh, does it, do you feel here the war? It's so close. I was kind of scary coming here. So how it feels for you? And then start the conversation. Or in Buryatia, where a lot of people were drafted to the war, they would ask something like, oh, do you have someone uh, drafted? Or like, what do you think? So there would be many, many other ways to, to, to do it, which allowed us to receive just different type of data and analyze it in a different way than interviews or mm. surveys. Yeah, and I guess uh, access to the field is crucial uh, to carry out this sort of research. And, and speaking of ethnographic work, Jeremy, uh, you said that you have uh, 20 years uh, of uh, ethnographic uh, interaction with the same, I guess, same group of people. And I wonder how the war has affected your work. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, and so I think all of our all of our presentations spoke to the value of um, what I think uh, Rita called like triangulating perspectives, right? So uh, it's possible to do survey work not being in Russia, having online participants, or it's also possible to have field workers in Svetlana's case that then uh, feed into that, and that's one form of triangulation. And then um, using the kind of work that I do uh, is another form of triangulation. But surely, yeah, for me personally and professionally, the challenge is that to have the kind of conversations that Svetlana was talking about in her field work, obviously you have to physically be present to some degree. And, you know, whether or not that's a possibility for me in the future, I don't know. But if I was going to give much stronger um, answers to the questions that I raised in my presentation, surely you know that requires um, immersive-based uh, immersion in fieldwork, uh, because exactly Svetlana described the problem um, that a lot of people are not talking about the war unless you have a way of prompting prompting them to talk about the war, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a really good example of how. Some of the people, and, and, and we are some of those people, using social media come up against very strong barriers immediately to the value of social media research. Because I can, like, I can WhatsApp this guy, Anton, any day of the week, and he'll be like, yeah, how's your family? I'm having a barbecue. Uh, I'm thinking of buying a new car. Uh, how much is your mortgage? Right? These are the conversations that you can have on social media. But if I wanted to ask him, do you feel safe from mobilization in your new job? This is not something that he's going to talk to me about on WhatsApp, at least mm -hmm. reluctantly. You know, he's going to be really reluctant. So exactly the same challenges that Svetlana uh, raised. So, um, yeah, should we just move on then? Yeah. Okay, so Julie, you, I, I, you are the most experienced one here on researching closed uh, our society. Uh, I mean, in this panel, maybe not in the room. I'm not sure what everyone here is doing. So, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so but you have spent years researching an area that is closed off for most uh, researchers and especially researchers from the West. Uh, and I wonder if you have some insights on why and how to study such areas. Well, I think my starting point is probably that social reality is extremely messy anywhere and that our access of researchers uh, as researchers is very limited. 
how many interviews and close conversations you do, you're still going to have a problem with deciding on, so how do you explain things? How does this hang, hang together? Uh, and in the case of uh, uh, Chechnya, um, of course you can say there's no access, and for me there hasn't been access for very many years. Uh, <clears throat> so you cannot, since you cannot then uh, study Chechnya in an ethically defendable way or sound way, you should uh, avoid it. But I think that has uh, become ethically very, very problematic because Chechnya has been a black hole uh, and outside of people's attention for such a long time. And it's more, for me, it's more like I have, and you heard me, I was pretty engaged. You, you feel that when you start to try to look into it, and it's possible, you know, we still have Russian uh, um, independent media who have their an anonymous but journalists on the ground who give information and people actually answer things, you know, in the commentary. So you, you can access and try to find out. Uh, so, for my sake, yes, uh, I have the responsibility to piece together that information. And although it's difficult to, to access the society level, it's not difficult to access the state level here. Mm. I mean, Kadyrov's sayings and doings are very, very uh, clear and well documented. Mm. Thank you. Um, I would like uh, to ask one more question to Svetlana, uh, if I may. Uh, so, uh, you talked about people with consistent positions on the war. Uh, uh, not don't have consistent, sorry. You talked about people who don't have consistent positions on the war. But we know that there are people who are against the war and who, and who support the war. Uh, and I wonder, uh, do they perceive their relationship to the state differently than the people you talked about? Uh, yeah, uh, they, they do. Uh, and that's actually what's, what's interesting here. Uh, so people who uh, are usually researchers call them core opponents of the war or core supporters of the war, uh, they do talk about states differently, not only related to the war, but related to uh, other issues. Uh, and uh, what is important as for, uh, that is for both of them, uh, state, uh, they see the state as accountable uh, to the people. So, of course, opponents of the war are quite critical to the state. Supporters of the war uh, can be quite critical to the state, actually, can also praise state. Uh, but in both cases, they see this clear relationship and accountability of the state to the people. Uh, so, um, for example, um, uh, in um, uh, the city of Krasnodar, where we did our field work, uh, lots of people, I, and I had actually example on the slide here, I didn't really uh, read it, but uh, so lots of people complained uh, about uh, infrastructure problems in the city, like um, uh, so the city is actually uh, uh, highly populated, many people come to the city, uh, new huge apartment complexes are built, but uh, uh, there are no schools, no proper health care, huge traffic jams, and all the people in the city in our field work were constantly complain, complaining about it. And people, those kind of uh, people I talked about, those who justify the war in general, they uh, identify these problems, but they would not really, I mean, they would justify it saying, well, the city of Krasnodar was just built this way historically, right? And the local authorities or the state can, can do nothing in this case. Uh, but then, uh, we talk to some people uh, who are have consistent perception of the war, who are politicized and who support the war. But talking about local problems in Krasnodar, they would say something like, uh, look, uh, it's actually corruption, which we see on all levels of the state. And here in Krasnodar, of course, our local authorities are aware of what's going on, but these uh, uh, building companies, construction companies, just pay money for them, and that's why they're building it. Uh, so we see that people who have 
have consistent position right who, uh, on the war they also uh, kind of have political skills uh, skills of thinking about politics of thinking about state of thinking uh, about state in a completely different uh, way than those apolitical people who then were not able to form a consistent position on the war thank you Okay, I just see the time is running a little bit from us, so I think we have to collect a couple of questions from the from the audience. Uh, and if is Christina, you the one administrating this process? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. coughs> okay, so we can have those two, and then we will see uh, what more we can make time for. Uh, please keep it short and introduce yourselves before I'm asking the question. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Adrian Rockstad, Adrian Rockstad. I'm at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. <coughs> thank you for your presentations. I wanted to pick up on uh, the point that Natalia raised about the overall theme of, of strength versus weakness. Because the interesting thing about all your uh, presentations is that you, you know, we have a supposedly strong state here who comes down very hard on any direct challenge to its authority, etc. and so on. We all know that. But you are describing a society that in many ways, or that it has a weaker grip on the society that it's supposed to govern, right? People have all kinds of ways of, of little tricks of getting out, of removing themselves from the state, etc. and so on. And so I was wondering uh, if you could say some more about how your research shows, or what the, your research shows about this complex relationship between state strength, state weakness, and how society relates to the state. Thank you, and we can have the second question right away. Yes, uh, my name is Lars Peder Hager. I'm an associate professor at the uh, Air Force Academy. Mm. Uh, my question uh, is uh, mostly to those who do qualitative research, but everyone is, of course, welcome to answer. And that is uh, not about war, but about peace. And do you encounter, and is it possible to m somehow measure what are acceptable ideas of a future peace mm. here? Because as we know, when, when the fighting stops one way or another, for, for a peace to be lasting, you have to have uh, acceptance of a kind of peace. So, do you find anything, or is that beyond the realm of what people dare to formulate? Thank you. Thank you. Um, who would like to start? Margarita? Thank you. Okay, so uh, if I may, I will start with the last question, because I have a very precise answer mm -hmm. to that. Good. Uh, yes, there are ways actually to study under which conditions and what kind of proposal would be more acceptable for certain groups of population. So it's called conjoint experiment. It comes from marketing research, for example, when you choose between two types of soaps, for example. M pardon my comparison, which is completely <laughs> off, but so just to get you an idea. So it pretty much works the same way. So there are like two proposals offered to a respondent and then respondent makes their choices and we can cite several tasks like that to make sure that certain attitudes are robust and stable and not like just a contingent fluke or something like that so this is exactly what we're doing at the moment unfortunately it was literally impossible to fit squeeze it into this 10 minutes but we do have this data and hopefully we'll get more data in january so yes there are ways to do that to account for under which conditions certain groups will accept certain proposals again to the extent it matters under non-democratic <laughs> conditions. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, Jeremy? Oh, I was going to say Sveta can go okay. <laughs> in the same order that we presented. Um, okay, I just thought that I talked, but yeah, uh, answered the l in long way the previous question. Um, so uh, I, I'll address the second question first as well, but in a more general way, uh, not, um, kind of um, do people, uh, would people accept, uh, would people who we study accept peace? And my answer here would be yes. Of course, that's actually what uh, we see it in our data very well, that that's what uh, unites people with very different perception of the war. So uh, even those people who are kind of for continuation of the war, uh, they still, as I tried to show, right, they still want uh, war to just finish in a kind of pleasant for Russia way, but to, to, to finish, right? So I don't see uh, any, so I mean, yes, of course, it's interesting to study uh, when and under what conditions people are, uh, will be ready to, uh, to 
uh, accepted, but there is definitely a kind of acceptance uh, here in general and um, uh, in, in the society. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. Um, yeah, and to go on with the, to, to respond again to the first question, um, strength, relative strength or weakness of the state and how that's understood. Mm -hmm. um, I think the war merely accelerates tendencies that were already there mm. in terms of how Russians, regardless of their um, intellectual resources, their informational resources, how they interpret what their state does. And that is increasing understanding that the state is not very good at anything except exercising its own coercion over its own and other citizens, mm. right? And so that's why mobilization in October 2022 was both a, sh was a shock because people felt it was a betrayal, but at the same time, immediately, they were thinking, well, of course, they're going to come after us, the weakest members of society, to um, deal with their own error, foreign policy error, right? So it's this... So, so the whole point of my work is to show that um, Russians, regardless of their um, informational intellectual resources, are actually often very, very, very good at interpreting what kind of society, what kind of politics is going on. And so even though I totally respect the kind of survey data that Rita's doing and what it shows about don't knows and the importance of being led by elite decision making and then either conforming or not conforming to that and, and in a similar way um, what was what Svetlana was talking about it, you know, peace peace would be acceptable, uh, but it would have to be a peace that the, the elite would also agree to. Um, yeah, my work is more about saying, well, actually, uh, even people without any resources that are powerless have, have the capacity to develop, to develop significant political subjectivity. So political subjectivity under authoritarian regimes is, is kind of my wheelhouse. And so peace, the question of peace... Um, I, I, like, I like the experiment that you talk about, Rita, but again, you're talking about consumers, right, that have free choice. So I can have my nice expensive soap, my nice soap, which would be Crimea and the Donbass, or I can have my not very nice soap, which would be giving back Crimea and the Donbass, right? Uh, but I'm not a consumer, right? As you said so yourself, I don't have that choice. I'm going to be presented that choice by the elite. So on that sense, the, the question of what Russians... Uh, what peace Rus Russians would be happy with is a, is a meaningless question eventually because they know themselves that they won't be given the choice. Mm. Mm. Really? Okay, so I can address um, the question of strong and weak. I think from seeing it from my uh, uh, case, uh, it's obvious that the Putin regime has been strong because it has had some kind of appeal to the major Russian constituency. And the problem with mobilizing the population for war is that he risks losing that. So he avoids, uh, you know, uh, uh, mobilizing from the urban areas, from the middle class and upwards. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and then he has to rely on poorer peripheral areas and ethnic minorities. Um, but that, in a way, gives him a new problem, because to mobilize the ethnic minorities, as I said, to mobilize the Chechens, you have to speak Chechen. And we see it now in the occupied territories in Donbass. He is trying to use, uh, recreate the Cossack identity uh, and mobilize under that to make people go into into his war so in a way he's he's in a weak position now because he's also thwarting his own attempt to create a kind of russian nationalist unity because he has to uh, uh he has to cater to those different groups to make them uh, uh mobilized so that's that's one i i follow closely uh, because what we're seeing, if you put the different um, uh, ideologies for going to war together, is a very, very eclectic picture. I, for example, read that the, the Muslim board is now taking a lead role in helping to mobilize soldiers for the war, and that the Mufti of Tatarstan has been to the front seven times. Uh, 
So what kind of ideas, you know, what makes them go to war? It's not a kind of a Russian nationalist project which comes out of it. It's a very mixed, uh, mixed picture. Mm. Thank you, Svetlana, you wanted to say? Uh, yeah, I just forgot to address the uh, first question. Uh, and I wanted to look at it from, okay, I'll try, uh, slightly different angle. Uh, from the angle of uh, how war perception looks from outside, uh, taking into account the state's propaganda. So we see on the uh, one hand, this huge numbers of war support, right? Sometimes 70, 80%, but even 50 something looks kind of a lot. Uh, in a way, uh, we did this uh, report I mentioned, uh, and uh, um, so, uh, second and third are devoted to uh, war justification for the most part. Uh, and the second one is called uh, resigning to inevitability. And the third one is called, well, in Russian, nada uh, как or in English, we need to carry on. So you kind of I guess, uh, see the feeling here. Uh, and uh, also lots of people, Natalia actually yesterday <laughs> also said that uh, it kind of uh, gives this uh, sad emotion. It's like people continue to justify the war, right? People continue saying they're okay with that. And from this perspective, we see, well, that's what the state wants, right? That's the picture we see from outside. But actually what we are trying to do, we're trying to show that, well, look, uh, and it, at it from another angle, people do criticize the war. Yes, they do it, not in the way we imagine anti-war criticism. They're not saying it's a moral uh, kind of crime to kill innocent people. They will not say it, of course, but they still, uh, even in uh, this authoritarian regime with the uh, authorities in power like that, they still do criticize the war. They do it constantly, right? They still uh, listening to this propaganda. They still invent their own ways to reconcile with it. Uh, and I think it's important to, to remember that, right? So if uh, even in these conditions, people actually uh, still have uh, lots of uh, kind of potential for criticism. And if condition, if the society, if the state will change, we will see completely different picture mm. here. Mm. Thank you, Svetlana, for highlighting uh, that very, very important perspective on, uh, on Russian society today. I think this, is, this has to be the last word for this panel. Thank you so much for this very interesting discussion. Let's give a...